We are out of time. A race against the clock to Thank save you. the planet. Delegates from nearly 200 countries discuss ways to tackle climate change. But will the rhetoric result in any real action? I'm Sean Calebs filling in for Anand Naidu, and this is The Heat. Welcome, everyone. After two weeks, the UN climate talks in Madrid look to be wrapping up without a breakthrough on the urgent need to cut greenhouse gas emissions. The slow progress inside the halls of the conference is in stark contrast to the protest outside, where anger over inaction reached a fevered pitch. Now, earlier, I spoke with David Wallace Wells. He is the author of The Uninhabitable Earth, Life After Warming whose fatalistic view of the climate crisis reads like a horror story. I ask him if the doom and gloom scenario was meant to scare people. Well, I think what I'm, what I'm really trying to do is be honest about the state of the science, which is frankly quite alarming. And as a journalist, I think the main, my main job on any subject is to, is to tell the truth. Um, I think that the science is terrifying, which means that any honest reckoning with it should scare us all. And I do think that um, fear can be motivating and mobilizing and pro productive um, in terms of you know, generating climate action. I think that is sort of um, that's been reflected in decades of environmental activism that have used um, that has used fear to, to move public opinion. But I think it's most um, clearly illustrated by the movement we've seen over the last year. Last October, the UN released a quite alarming report um, studying the difference between a world at 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming and 2 degrees Celsius of warming, and it was much more urgent and alarmist in its rhetoric than anything that had ever been published by the community of scientists yeah. before. And I don't think it's any coincidence that in the year since, we've seen an unprecedented amount of political mobilization around climate, from Greta and the, and the school strikes to Extinction Rebellion in the UK, Sunrise and the Green New Deal in the US. I don't think that fear is the only way to understand this story. I think we should also be thinking in terms of the opportunities that are available to us if we take action. But I think for a very long time, um, we weren't scared enough. And as a result, we fell into a kind of complacency characterized by really catastrophic inaction. Let's talk about what we saw unfold around the world last year, everything from punishing fires, uh, typhoons, hurricanes. And you also wrote, like many Americans, are fatally complacent and willfully deluded. What did you mean by that? And are these uh, catastrophes, in essence, a wake-up call? Well, what I meant by fatally complacent and, and deluded, I mean, that's, I, I'd say that about myself, too. I don't try to hold myself above this. But I think in America, especially, we, um, we often point the finger at fossil fuel companies and um, the sort of climate deniers who may be in Congress and say that these are the only forces holding us back from climate action. But I think many more of us are functionally living in denial about climate change than we would like to admit. We are not prioritizing this crisis at the level that the science demands in our politics. We are not adjusting our lives or calling for reforms of our culture or our economy mm -hmm. um, to the degree that the scientists would say is absolutely necessary to avoid what they call a catastrophic level of warming. And so I think we need to reckon with some of those forces of denial as well, not just the more direct um, you know, emphasis by the by people in power to push action down the road. But I do think that over the last couple of years, beginning in 2017, we've started to see extreme weather events in the northern hemisphere mm -hmm. that are undeniably a feature of a new climate system. And I think for the first time as a result, the world is really, really waking up to this challenge. That includes the wildfires in California, which have grown fivefold since the 1970s, and we're now seeing wildfires every summer in the Arctic. It includes um, storms like those that have hit Houston, five 500-year storms in five years. This is a storm that we should expect to see only once every five centuries, which means only one of them hit since Europeans arrived in North America. And we've seen five of them hit Houston in just the last five years. The incredible hurricanes across the Caribbean, the flooding in the Midwest that's completely capsized the business of all American farmers this mm -hmm. year, so that 40% of their income this year has come from government bailouts and insurance money. Um, we are already starting to see in the Northern Hemisphere 
a world transformed by climate impacts. And I think it's having a dramatic impact on public opinion, which has moved 10 or 15 points just over the last year or two. But of course, we're a little behind the curve on this. Many of these impacts have already struck parts of the developing world and around the equator um, in decades past. There have been studies this year showing that many of the equatorial countries of the world may have lost as much uh, as 25 percent of their GDP capacity over recent decades because of climate change. And those studying the relationship between temperature and conflict say that the entire phenomenon of Islamic fundamentalism and terrorism that has arisen in the Middle East over recent decades is in part due to the changes in the climate which have made life in that part of the world um, much more difficult. It will only get more difficult in the decades ahead when we're expected to see by just 2050 many of the biggest cities in South Asia and the Middle East so hot during summer that in heat waves at least you won't be able to walk around outside right. without risking heat stroke and death. David, you, know, you were talking about the call for change and we're seeing that in Madrid right now with COP25. But people have also pointed to the carbon footprint just to get all those world leaders and activists there uh, releasing something like 60,000 tons of carbon dioxide into the air uh, through that effort. Do these meetings work? Those are, to me, it's two sort of different questions. There's the, the sort of charge of climate hypocrisy, which I think is a little bit overblown. I do think that it would be good to have these kinds of meetings in more carbon neutral ways if we could manage them. Um, but I also think that what is often described as hypocrisy is actually just the yearning to be better collectively than we are as individuals. If we are trying to engineer and organize a new global system that can allow us to secure a livable, prosperous, and just climate future for ourselves, um, that is much more important than the climate impact of those air tickets to Madrid. On the other hand, this is COP25. It's the 25th climate conference of this kind established under the auspices of the UN. And I think looking at the previous 24, you'd have to say that all of them have failed. Um, the Paris Accords were signed a few years ago under the same system, and it was probably the most ambitious um, effort to establish a kind of climate legislation or climate law that would govern our behavior going forward. We're just three years into the um, since three years since we signed the Paris Accords, and no major industrial nation on the entire planet is on track to honor its commitments right. under those accords, which I think is um, an indictment of the system as a whole. On the other hand, there are not many other better options. Um, it's hard to imagine what kind of progress could be made globally if we were not acting in concert in a global coordinated effort, because this is a global problem. The impacts are distributed globally, such right. that even if individual nations wanted to make very aggressive decarbonization projects, um, their benefits would be distributed around the world, and they would actually see very little impact within their own borders. Well, let's talk um, about the, the let's, let's talk just a bit about the Paris Accord and U.S. President Donald Trump indicating he's going to pull the United States uh, out of that. In the U.S., the second largest emitter of greenhouse gases, certainly the nation that benefited the most from the Industrial Revolution forward. And in your book, you write, this puts Donald Trump's commitment to withdraw from the treaty in a useful perspective. In fact, his spite may ultimately prove perversely productive since the evacuation of American leadership on climate seems to have mobilized China. First, let's talk about the significance of the U.S. polling out of this and China, one of the, I guess, the largest emitter and for generations uh, vilified as being the big villain, now leading the way in environmental efforts. Well, I would say, I would, I would describe a little bit renewable anywhere in the world, but they're also continuing to open it. And I actually think that that Canada, the very next day here, we're seeing that kind of climate hypocrisy everywhere. But of course, Macron, famously with the Gilets Jaunes last year, failed to pass a carbon tax within his own borders. So I think that there is a bit of um, gamesmanship and, and political theater mm -hmm. to the geopolitics of climate. We haven't yet really developed a new framework like that which we developed about human rights and um, market forces in the aftermath of World War II, but I think that's, I think that's coming. Thinking about um, the, uh, the role of the U.S. Um, in this problem, I think, you know, you're absolutely right to point out that China's the world's biggest emitter with a footprint almost twice as big as the U.S. today. Of course, the U.S. per capita footprint is considerably bigger than China's, and since carbon stays in the atmosphere for hundreds of years, it's actually more um, reflective of our responsibility to look at historical emissions, and there the U.S. contribution dwarfs China, not just on a per capita basis, but on an aggregate basis. Um, I think for that reason, the U.S. has a moral obligation to play a leadership role on this issue. We're also 
much farther along economically, much wealthier, and therefore much more able to transition to some renewable energy sources than countries like China or India or other nations in sub-Saharan Africa would be. On the other hand, the U.S. is already doing relatively well when it comes to climate. Our emissions are basically stable. When you look at the West as a whole, the post-industrial landscape shows that um, in many countries across Europe and, and North America, um, emissions are, if not falling already, then about to fall. And to the extent that this problem will be dictated over the next few decades by what we do going forward, which right. is absolutely the case, it will very much be based on what pathways are taken, not just by China, but also by India and sub-Saharan Africa, which are um, nations and policies that it's hard for us to have any control over. Um, to me, it's interesting. Do... I'm, I'm sorry. To me, it's, it's, it's interesting that you point out that uh, there's a very strong scientific argument that man is the one that got us here. So hopefully man can lead us out of this coming catastrophe, if, I, if, if you will. And in your book, you give a view of the climate change saying, no matter how hot it gets, no matter how fully climate change trans transforms the planet and the way we live on it, it will always be the case that the next decade could contain more warming and more suffering or less warming and less suffering. Just how much is up to us and will always be that we know global warming is our doing and should be a comfort, not a cause for despair. So is there hope? Well, it depends what you mean by hope. If what you're looking to do is to secure a climate like the one we have today, where already many people all around the world are suffering because of climate change, there is no hope. Um, scientists say that if we completely decarbonized and never emitted another ounce of carbon tomorrow, probably just thanks to the carbon that's already in the atmosphere today, we'd be due for about a half degree more of warming. And given all of the political and economic and cultural obstacles to that kind of decarbonization, I think it's practically speaking impossible for us to pull up short of about two degrees of warming, which would mean um, hundreds of millions of climate refugees, damages from storms and sea level rise growing a hundredfold from what they are today, and at least 150 million people dying from air pollution alone, it's been estimated. That's death at the scale of 25 holocausts. I think that's about our best case scenario, and it's not pretty. On the other hand, if you base your um, baseline of expectations not on where we are today, but on where we're headed on our projected baseline going forward, scientists, there's some debate about it, but would say that if we're on the track we're on, continuing through the end of the century, would probably bring us to at least three degrees Celsius of warming and maybe even four or above that. And given that baseline, I think there's quite a lot we can and will and are already doing to avoid that amount of suffering, which is really important given the point that you made in quoting, in quoting from my book. This is not a binary challenge. It's not a matter of will climate change defeat us or will we defeat it. We are already living in a world defined by climate change, not just in terms of weather impacts, but the way it's shaping our politics and our culture and our psychology. And exactly how dramatically it will change our world remains up to us. And even if we land in a quite hellish scenario at three degrees or four degrees, even then, if we continue to emit more carbon, we will be warming the planet further and making the future generations okay. suffer more. Okay. Or we could choose to reduce our emissions and reduce that amount of suffering. So this is not a binary system. It's a, it's a spectrum. And where on that spectrum of suffering we land is absolutely up to us. Oh, great.